Sustainability Defined would like to thank Native Energy for sponsoring this episode. Since 2000, Native Energy has worked with hundreds of organizations to develop authentic solutions to their sustainability challenges and implement community-scale projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, strengthen businesses, and contribute to progress around the world. Native Energy is proud to be a public benefit corporation and a certified B Corporation. To learn more about Native Energy and the services it offers, go to www.native.eco. All right, listeners, welcome back to Sustainability Defined, where Scott and I are here defining sustainability one concept and one bad joke at a time. This is episode 52 on pollinators. So, Scott, why don't we just buzz right through this outline real quick? All right. Nice one, Jay. So we're first going to talk about what do pollinators do? Then we'll discuss who these pollinators are, why they're important, and then how many of these pollinator folks are there and what are the threats to them? What efforts exist to help the pollinators, including Native Energy's efforts? What can listeners do to help pollinators? And lastly, we'll give some background on our three, count them three, interviewees. All right. So, Jay, what do pollinators do? Well, Scott, a pollinator is any animal that transfers pollen grains from flower to flower. They transfer the pollen grains as they drink nectar, feed off the pollen, or do other activities. So, listener, yes, even plants can have sex, as pollination is usually an unintended result of a pollinator transferring pollen grains from the male part of the plant, the anther, to the female part of the plant, the stigma. Once the pollen is successfully transferred, seeds or fruits can develop and the flower can reproduce. Here, Scott, we have the birds and the bees. Nice job, Jay. We run a family-friendly podcast, and I think you successfully navigated that. (laughs) (laughs) much to the delight of both myself and any other younger listeners out there. So Scott, let's move now and ask who are these pollinators, these frisky pollinators we're talking about. Right. So we got some frisky birds, bats, (laughs) butterflies, moths, flies, beetles, wasps, certain small mammals, and most importantly, Jay, of course, the bees. And we'd have to be here a while if I rattled all of them off. There's approximately 200,000 different species of animals around the world that act as pollinators. Of these, about 1,000 or 0.5% are vertebrates, such as birds, bats, and small mammals. The rest are invertebrates. These include flies, beetles, and butterflies, moths, and bees. Now, Jay, bees often get a lot of the credit, but non-bee pollinators, they're important too. One global study found that non-bees perform 25 to 50% of flower visits. All right, Jay, so why are all these 200,000 pollinator species so important? Somewhere between 75 and 95% of all flowering plants on Earth need pollinators to help with pollination. So without pollinators, humans and wildlife wouldn't have much to eat or look at since most all flowers would not survive. Now, not all plants and crops require animal-mediated pollination, For example, wheat is wind-pollinated, but pollinators provide their free pollination services to over 180,000 different plant species and more than 1,200 crops, which is nearly 75% of crops worldwide. Now, Jay, most people that know me know that I like a good deal, and I feel like (laughs) pollinators give us the best deal around. And people will hear that when they hear the economic impact in just a moment. But how does all this pollination, Jay, how does it relate to the average listener? Well, first for you foodies out there, one out of every three bites of food you eat is there because of pollinators. Without pollinators, it'd be difficult to get the variety of vitamins and minerals that we need to stay healthy. For example, antioxidants like several forms of vitamin E, more than 90% of the available vitamin C, are provided by crops that are pollinated by bees and other animals. If you're more of a finance person than a foodie, fear not, we have a stat for you too. Every year, pollinators add $24 billion to the U.S. economy and $217 billion to the global economy. 
Those economic benefit numbers don't include the indirect products of plants, such as milk and beef from cows fed on alfalfa, or medicinal products like morphine and aspirin that are derived from plants that depend on bees for pollination. There we go again, Jay, talking in the many billions of dollars of benefits uh, from these sustainability. It's not all hippy-dippy stuff. And Scott, I ha- I'm, I'm left thinking, all these pollinators provide so many benefits, and what do they come to the table and ask for? Nothing. They're, they're exactly. just so generous. And we swatted them, you know, like, oh, don't stink What me. is going on? One that should resonate with all listeners, Jay, because we all care about the environment, is that pollinators support healthy ecosystems. They're cleaning the air, stabilizing soils, preventing erosion, protecting us from severe weather, and supporting other wildlife through their work. And oh yeah, Jay, all the flowers that pollinators enable, they're beautiful to look at. And that includes my girlfriend's favorite flower, Jay, the sunflower. Scott, if if Shannon did not hear you say that as we're recording this now, I suggest you might have some ready for her by the time she hears this. Right, because oh, she would. Love she that. knows you know now, and, and now there's no excuse for you not. To I'm have normally it. like, why would I get you flowers? They're gonna die. I want to get you something useful. And she's like, no, they're pretty. That doesn't matter. From from so, what I understand, it's the gesture. <laughs> but I, that, I have that, to kind of agree. My mom tells me that too. She's like, <laughs> women like flowers. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, back to where we were, listeners. We should also note that it's not just about increasing the overall number of pollinators, but making sure all pollinators survive and thrive as well, because many plants have developed characteristics to attract very particular pollinators. If certain pollinators decline, it threatens many plants and vice versa. Hummingbirds, for example, see red very well, but they have no sense of smell. Plants that attract hummingbirds are red, nearly odorless, and have petals that dust the hummingbird's head and back with pollen as it hovers above the flower to sip nectar. So here we have an example of this amazing, highly specialized and symbiotic relationship of, of two very specific characteristics that, that allow each one to flourish. Right. So I think, Jay, we can agree. I hope our listeners agree. Pollinators are super important. So sadly, though, they're under threat from a lot of different sources. So let's talk about those. We mentioned that there's 200,000 Different species of pollinators around the world. Sounds like a lot, but pollinator populations are declining due to these increasing threats. First, let's get a sense, though, before taking through those threats, of the amount of decline we're seeing in the pollinator populations. We're seeing significant amounts of honeybee colonies lost each year. The Bee Informed Partnership surveys thousands of beekeepers, managing hundreds of thousands of bee colonies each year. During the 2019 to 2020 winter, an estimated 22.2% of all managed honeybee colonies in the U.S. were lost. And the historic average for the survey is 28.6%. That's a lot every year that the the managed honeybees we lose. And Scott, I even might suggest that listeners just stop and reflect on those percentages. They're they're pretty striking. I mean, if you were to lose anything to the amount of 22.2% over one year, I think you'd be pretty concerned. This problem we're talking about is particularly bad for native unmanaged species. At least 28% of North America's bumblebees have undergone significant declines, including species that were formerly common and widespread. In 2017, the rusty patched bumblebee, which Scott, for whatever reason in my mind, I see as like a pirate themed bumblebee, the name (laughs) rusty patched bumblebee. (laughs) Sounds like a good Halloween costume for you, Jay. (laughs) Hey. You can educate while having people enjoy your costume. All right, if I come across any listeners that are also dressed as Rusty Patrick Bumblebees, that's going to be shared immediately. (laughs) Anyways, so back to the stat. In 2017, this Rusty Patrick Bumblebee, which has disappeared from 87% of its historic range, became the first bumblebee to be listed as an endangered species. And who wants a pirate-themed bee species to go endangered? Butterflies in the U.S. have also undergone significant declines. 19% are at risk of extinction. The iconic monarch butterfly, for example, has experienced declines of 74 to 80% in populations both east and west of the Rocky Mountains. Okay, so significant declines in the population of these pollinators, Jay. What are the threats to these pollinators? What's causing this? Well, there's too many to list here, but let's discuss some of the largest. One threat is the loss in feeding and nesting habitats or degradation of these habitats due to a change in land use for agriculture, resource extraction, 
or urban and suburban development. Now, you could try to reflower, but many of these pollinator species are habitat specific, and thus they can't forage, nest, or overwinter in a new place very easily. Another habitat related issue is that certain plants or animals brought here from other places can decrease the quality of pollinator habitats. They often crowd out the wildflowers needed for pollination and attract pollinators away from the native species. A second threat is pesticide misuse and drift from aerial spraying. One example is neonicotinoids, or neonics, that are a class of insecticides that can affect the central nervous system of insects, resulting in paralysis and death. Check out episode 3 on neonics for more information. Yet another threat is parasites and diseases. Key parasites and diseases affecting honeybees include varora mites, hive beetle, and colony collapse disorder. The varora mite has been considered the greatest single driver of the global honeybee health decline. These mites feed on the fat tissue of bees, often in the process transferring diseases including a lethal one that deforms wings and prevents bees from flying. I had heard of colony collapse disorder, but this varroa mite sounds even worse and really kind of cruel, huh, Jay? You would hope that it could just do its business in the bee's fat, you know, slim it down for springtime and get out of there. Yeah. But you've got these other consequences that are having serious impacts. All right, Jay. And the last threat is, of course, sadly, climate change. As the temperature changes, plants are migrating and changing their blooming patterns, all of which upsets the delicate balance between pollinators and plants. So here's a striking example. Climate change is making flowers bloom half a day earlier each year on average. That might not sound like a lot, but this means that plants are now blooming a month earlier than 45 years ago. Plants blooming earlier by this much means some pollinators and plants may actually miss each other. Isn't that sad? It's sad, and, and Scott, maybe not quite as important, but still very important. This means that next year you're having to get Shannon's flowers a half day earlier, so don't miss those either. So, so mark that down. You're right. I got it. All right. So let's ask what efforts exist to help pollinators. We, of course, have to talk about the best week of the year, National Pollinator Week. Oh, the best. <laughs> what, what more could you ask for? Mm. In 2007, the U.S. Senate unanimously approved and designated a week in June called National Pollinator Week. Unanimously approved. I mean, it brings people together. We need more of that, Scott. We need A, <laughs> more pollinators, and B, more unanimous decisions here in the U.S. Senate. Yeah. Anyways, the Pollinator Partnership was the driving force behind the National Week designation and has led the charge on it ever since. And speaking of the Pollinator Partnership, it's the largest 501c3 dedicated exclusively to the health, protection, and conservation of all pollinating animals. And Jay, I'm also very happy that we have these wonderful pop filters for saying things like pollinator partnership. <laughs> Listeners, right. for those of you that don't know, without these things, we would be just via RPs, just blowing air into your eardrums, and no one really wants that. It also makes us look more legit. Right, in all these pictures, which is almost, if very not important. equally as important. Yes. So the pollinator partnerships actions for pollinators include education, conservation, restoration, policy, and research. In fact, a lot of the info for these intro notes, they came from their website. Now, Pollinator Partnership also spearheads a cool collaborative effort to help pollinators called the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, the NAPPC. The NAPPC is a body of more than 160 diverse partners, including respected scientists, researchers, conservationists, government officials, and dedicated volunteers. Now, one accomplishment of the NAWPC is 31 web-based eco-regional planting guides for all regions of the U.S. to prepare the way for healthy, pollinator-friendly landscapes across millions of farms, homes, schools, parks, and corporate landscapes. So you can go online, enter your zip code, and you can find your local planting guide. And now, Jay, there's more to come in our upcoming section on what listeners can do to help pollinators. But that's a tease. That's one. Just one. Just one. Now, the NAPPC is focused on pollinators generally, but there are also efforts focused on particular pollinators. One example is the Monarch Joint Venture, a partnership of federal and state agencies, non-governmental organizations, businesses, and academic programs 
working together to protect the monarch migration across the U.S. Businesses have also acted to save pollinators in part because many of their products depend on a thriving pollinator population. For example, more than a decade ago, haagen launched the haagen Loves Honeybees initiative. Through the initiative, more than $1 million has been donated to pollinator education, and haagen grows its crops in a way that supports bee populations. I do love a good strawberry haagen I must say. It's good. Scott, I got to say, I'm more of a Ben & Jerry's guy. Me too. I just like their strawberry. All right. And that's fair. All right. So <laughs> there's also the fantastic work that Native Energy is doing in collaboration with a variety of businesses to build renewable energy projects in a way that, thanks to a partnership with pollinator expert Rob Davis, also create more pollinator habitat. So how's that done? Well, by creating pollinator-friendly solar where the pollinator-friendly ground cover is placed under and around solar arrays instead of using turf grass or gravel. So it's a solar design that is comparable in cost while providing meaningful benefits to agriculture and ecosystems. In short, Jay, by putting this pollinator-friendly habitat with the solar panels, it's our favorite, a win-win, this time for conservation and clean energy. Count it. Count it. Native Energy has worked with Cliff Bar, Lush Cosmetics, Lime Bikes, Stonyfield, Design Techs, and others on these renewable energy slash pollinator projects. Rob Davis explains more in his TED Talk, quote, this unlikely 1960s space tech can help save the bees. And we'll learn more about these projects in our interview coming up in just a bit. So let's ask now, what can listeners do to help pollinators? And Scott, let's run down the list. Oh boy, Jay, there's a lot here. So first, one thing you can do is plant pollinator-friendly plants in your garden. For example, you could put in plants that have hollow stems that bees can hang out in, you know, talk about their day, Uh, (laughs) but they can also just be there during the winter. These include raspberry brambles, coneflowers, and elderberries. You could also plant milkweed plants, which monarchs rely on to thrive and continue their migration and generational cycles. And now, Jay... We're going to talk to a special guest, my mom, Adrian Breen, who's going to explain how she's planted some milkweeds and how she's helped her friends plant some too. Fantastic. All right. Mom, Adrian Breen, you are on the podcast. This is Yay! great. <laughs> so many of our listeners have been waiting for this. So mom, you not only helped research this episode, but you did something firsthand to help the pollinators. You planted milkweeds. You shared it with your friends. So Uh, And I love you for it uh, and for many other reasons. Tell (laughs) the listeners uh, where they can get the seeds and how they can go about planting them. Well, I'd love to. And of course, I find all of your podcasts so inspirational (laughs) and went and met with my garden club of longtime friends, which is Mm -hmm. back Bookie, Marianne and myself and ordered uh, milkweed seed packets very inexpensively where you get five packets of seeds for $10. And you can also even get them free if you send a self-addressed stamped envelope and the address wow. is Save Our Monarchs, P.O. Box 390135, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55439. What you need to know though is when you get the seeds, you need to put them in a wet paper towel, then in a plastic bag and refrigerate them for 30 days. So you want to keep that in mind uh, when you do order your plants. Once they come, and I'm waiting for my milkweeds to sprout, and I have it all uh, in a safe place, you can track your butterflies and do that online with the Monarch Joint Venture. And even locally, we have a wonderful Monarch way station here in our area that my friend Sarah is already part of. So we're really working very hard to stay sustainable and uh, also help our monarchs. Well, thanks, Mom. Go Northbrook, Illinois. Good for good for us. <laughs> and that's exciting, Mom. So it sounds like your milkweeds haven't sprouted yet, but when they do, take a photo and we'll share it on our social media so our listeners can see your wonderful milkweeds. Oh, I hope they come up, and I will be sure to do that. And I want to just thank both of you again for enlightening me and so many of us about so many important aspects of sustainability and what's going on in our planet. And I'm proud of, very proud of both of you. 
A- right. Adrian, you're giving us the butterflies here. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jay, I figured I'd branch out into something like ah, that. Oh, wow. so. oh, she's good. Nice. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Mom. And you are a big help to the podcast and help make it all possible. And I love you for your support of this side venture, this this fun thing that Jay and I do, and love you for many other reasons. So thank you, Mom. Love you both. So proud of you. And I am the LMITW. <laughs> oh, maybe we should tease on social media, what that means. Okay. Thanks, mom. Love you, honey. Thanks, Adrian. All right. Getting back to what listeners can do to help pollinators. Number two is reduce your pesticide use. Yes, even organic ones. If you're going to spray them on your plants, spray in the evening after the pollinators have stopped flying. A third thing listeners can do is support local bees and honey keepers. Look for the Bee Better Certified Seal. It indicates that certified ingredients were grown in ways that support bees, butterflies, and other pollinators. So when you buy these Be Better certified products, it directly benefits farms that prioritize pollinator conservation. And of course, if you're listening to this episode, you like learning things, you can of course keep learning to help figure out how else you can help pollinators. Our listeners are so smart, Jay. Just They're just listening. They're learning all the time. And we love them for it, Scott. Love them. So you can learn more, as we just mentioned. You can also reach out to friends and family and share on social media to inform and inspire others to act. One short video you can watch to learn more and share is the seven-minute TED Talk from Louis Schwartzberg titled The Hidden Beauty of Pollinators. It's a riveting presentation, and we guarantee the images will evoke audible woes. Whoa. Whoa. Our researcher (laughs) Shannon Parker also suggests an episode of the Netflix docuseries Rotten, called Lawyers, Guns, and Honey. It talks about supply chain issues with honey. We haven't talked too much about the commercial side of managing and providing needed pollinators to farmers across the country, but this episode gets into that and more. I've been meaning to watch that Netflix series, Rotten. It it does a different kind of part of our food system each episode, I believe. Have you seen it, Jay? You know, I actually haven't. It sounds like it's clearly pretty good, but it's it's funny, Scott. It, It makes me think of how food waste and just understanding our food system is one of the biggest impacts we as individuals can have on climate change. So I think we're both probably overdue to watch it. Totally. Okay. So the last section here is giving background on our interviewees. And we have three interviewees at once that are super, they know their stuff. Okay. You'll see. They say two's a party, three's a crowd. Could not be farther from the truth. Not in this case. Not at all. So Rob Davis is currently a director at the Center for Pollinators and Energy where he helps to accelerate the nation's transition towards clean energy. His content helps provide best practices on pollinator-friendly solar installation. Previously, Rob had a successful career in a variety of sectors, from tech startups to academia and more. Next up, we have Kevin Hackett. Kevin is currently the Client Strategy Director at Native Energy, where for over 13 years, he has been helping companies take action to achieve their climate ambitions and make lasting change within their businesses and communities around the globe. His work spans from building new renewable energy in the U.S. And yes, he has climbed the top of a wind turbine, something, Scott, I don't think you or I could claim. No, I want to do that. He's also covered regenerative agriculture in Argentina, so muy bien, Kevin. He can hack it. (laughs) (laughs) Ah. All right. Then last, we have Elisa Hammond. She's the Senior Vice President of Environmental Stewardship at Cliff Bar and Company with a background in agroecology, which we've covered, Jay, and crop science. Elisa originally started at Cliff Bar 19 years ago as an ecologist. And now as Senior Vice President of Environmental Stewardship, she leads their program focused on reducing its ecological footprint from field to the final product. All right, Jay, let's eat a Cliff Bar, get super jacked up on energy for this awesome interview. Let's do it. All right, we are now joined by three very esteemed guests to help us dive further into the pollinators topic. We have Rob Davis, the director of the Center for Pollinators and Energy at Fresh Energy. We have Kevin Hackett, the client strategy director at Native Energy. And we have Elisa Hammond, the senior vice president of environmental stewardship at Cliff Bar and Company. So Scott, we've got a party here today. We're excited to talk about pollinators. So Thanks to all three of you for joining us today. 
So good to be with you. All right, so let's start with an easy one for all three of you guys to get this conversation moving. So we're here talking about pollinators. We have to ask, what is your favorite pollinator? If you guys could each go through and tell us what your favorite one is, that'll really get us going. Pick among your babies here. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, picking among the, the babies is hard. <laughs> there are so many charismatic species. You know, people talk about the monarch and butterfly and the um, bumblebees being these charismatic indicator species. But, you know, I have to go with a, a tiny, tiny, tiny little, little pollinator. Um, it's actually a fly. And the name of it is a chocolate midge, M-I-D-J-G-E. Um, mm. It's a tiny little fly that is solely responsible for pollination of the cacao plant, which gives us all that delicious chocolate. Oh, man. That so, is important. Oh, my one. God. I love that one. <laughs> I didn't know about it before, but I love it. <laughs> and just so listeners know, that's that's Rob. And then maybe, Kevin, if you want to answer this one, just so they kind of get the difference in voices. Sure. You frame this up as an easy question. I feel a tremendous amount of pressure right now <laughs> to come up with something as good as Rob's or as uh, as funny as I can be. But I think I just have to go with uh, the monarch butterfly. It's the Vermont state butterfly. And it always mm-hmm. brings me back to uh, my fourth grade uh, classes around Vermont history and facts. So, Right. And, and Kevin, you are, you're speaking to us from Vermont, right? So that's a very appropriate answer. That's correct. So it's, uh, it's all linked. Nice. You, you, you passed the first question. Well done. Perfect. <laughs> All right, Elisa, bring us home. I have two sort of categories. One is for just incredibly sexy pollinators. I think that flowers that are night blooming and pollinated by bats, Ooh. like night blooming Sirius, with uh-huh. they have large flowers that are big enough for a bat to get in there and just rustle around with the pollen. And it's such a beautiful partnership, but I, I love plants so much. I love seeing these big bell-shaped flowers and say, hey, I know you're trying to attract a bat. Pretty cool. Very. Do you have some night vision goggles? You go out and try and see this in action? (laughs) I haven't, but that's a great idea. It's a good socially distant activity. (laughs) (laughs) The other thing I've learned since we've started working on pollinator habitat is I didn't realize that the majority of bees are ground-dwelling bees. We often think of hives. But um, this idea that these so many bees are just down there in little ground and holes in the ground and they emerge Mm. when it's time to pollinate, come out in spring. And that has just captured my imagination. We often think that we need to plant the ground solid with plants to restore an ecosystem. But we really need to think about the ground dwelling bees that live in open ground. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I wonder, and all three of you don't necessarily need to answer, but it, I'd be curious to know if there was something in your past that led to you being interested in pollinators. Was there one experience, one thing you learned? Maybe it was about the, the nighttime pollinators or the fact that there's one pollinator that helps all the cocoa plants, but can you tell us about what really just triggered this interest and fascination with pollinators? Yeah, for me, I mean, I, I was a an Eagle Scout back in the day. So I'd, I'd certainly spent a lot of time uh, sleeping on the ground in a tent uh, around a campfire, uh, hiking down trails. And, um, you know, the value of just being out there in the natural world is uh, is transformative. Mm-hmm. For me, I've always loved plants. And I think it wasn't till I took a botany class that I really started taking paying attention to pollinators. And I'm sort of obsessive about going out and looking at the plants in my own yard when they're in full bloom and there's all these pollinators sort of dancing and drunk on the the nectar because I like (laughs) to see these saddlebags of pollen on the bees. I think it's their hind legs. It's phenomenal. Dancing and drunk on pollen. That sounds like a party I'd like to go to. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) For me, it's been really just seeing the the connection between, you know, in this case, renewable energy, pollinators, our food systems, uh, and how all of those things are just tied together so intricately um, and really can, can work well together. And so, yeah, let's dive in now to this idea of using renewable energy sites as pollinator habitat. So from what we understand, the standard practice for a while with solar sites was 
We'll just use gravel, use monocrop lawn grass, not great for pollinators. But that changed in 2016 with Fresh Energy, Audubon Minnesota, and the Minnesota corn growers working with agricultural and business leaders to establish the nation's first statewide standard for vegetation on solar sites. And so what we're wondering is, how did this idea start? You know, was there one person that came up with it? Maybe it was you, Rob. Uh, and did it take a while for it to take root? And pun intended on that. Yeah, that's very nice. Well, I'll try to work as many terrible puns into the rest of the conversation. <laughs> um, my kids regularly beat up on me for dad jokes, but... Um, that means you're doing something uh, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they, they say the best ideas are, are, you know, not like just picked out of the blue, but are just improvements upon other people's ideas. And um, and so that's really what this is, is is that in Minnesota, we, we knew that the state, uh, which is where I'm calling in from, um, was going to grow very, very quickly from, you know, less than a thousand, less than a hundred acres of solar statewide to several thousand acres in just a period of one or two or three years. And, mm -hmm. and so we heard from some of our farmers and folks in, you know, in, in rural Minnesota that like, you know, what the heck were we doing being supportive of this industrial use? And so that really sent a shiver down all of our spines thinking, gosh, we have to pursue climate change solutions in partnership with the farming community and in partnership with the conservation community. And, um, and so we began a, a process of just uh, researching solutions and thank goodness um, other people had come up with an answer for us. We found these gorgeous pictures of West Mill Solar Park in the United Kingdom showing these beautiful acres of flowering meadows under and around solar panels and um, and thought, okay, we can we can absolutely do this. Um, we called up the ecologist and the developer and really wanted to know what went wrong, you know, and what went right and how this practice could best be imported to the United States and adapted, you know, specifically for uh, for North American challenges and opportunities and then brought to scale. And so that's that's what you see is that, you know, we, we imported that idea from West Mill and the UK into Minnesota and then have been uh, collaborating with state-based leaders in conservation and agriculture and energy to establish standards throughout uh, throughout the country. Yeah, I mean, when when you're not sure, just Google it. So <laughs> that's right. Well, well, that's and, right. and seriously, I mean, I think it's pretty cool that that with this vast knowledge base that Rob, you were able to take advantage of the the thing materialized very quickly, and all of a sudden, boom, you're making meaningful progress on an idea that that is relatively recent, at least the, the newest iteration of this idea. But as you were researching and Googling, I'm curious, can you give us a sense of scale? How many solar sites out there, you know, is there a particular percentage that have pollinator habitat? And then is there a number that don't, but that could? Yeah, there is. There is. Today in the United States, there's around uh, 6,500 acres of, uh, of pollinator-friendly solar, again, against 300,000 acres of turf grass or bare ground solar. So um, practice is in its infancy. Uh, however, you know, we've seen solar is growing fast. And, you know, considering we're going to build 10 times more by 2030, now is the right time to you know to work out the kinks of these best practices so that they can efficiently uh, be brought to scale and listeners to, to put that in context i just did some quick number crunching that's about two percent robs that sound about right so it's it's young but something certainly we want to try to expedite in growth as as more and more solar panels take root that's that's exactly right. It's it's young. Um, however, it is the, the one of the fastest uh, growing best practices in terms of adoption. And we certainly see the performance benefits for the photovoltaics uh, the solar farm owner, the conservation benefits, the agricultural benefits. Um, and there's more, you know, there's there's pollinator friendly solar farms uh, from one acre to 1500 acres in 20 states. So, you know, so 20, in 20 different states, you can, you can get in your car and drive to and go see a pollinator friendly solar array. Um, and so they have a, an example of how they can regionalize it and develop it appropriately uh, to scale it up in their states. And that sounds like yet another good socially distant activity to go do. Uh, <laughs> sure is. 
But I'm wondering, you know, it seems like a no-brainer. Is there any reason why someone building a, a solar site wouldn't put in the pollinator habitat? Do they just not know about it, or there's something else going on? Yeah, you know, the, the, um, the hardest, fiercest obstacle in this work we're finding um, is status quo. Is that yesterday and the day before, my banker and my financier and my insurance company, they signed off on a design for a solar farm that it's just like the one the day before, mm-hmm. just like the one the day before. And because, you know, photovoltaic solar got its start in the desert southwest, a lot of those civil engineering plans have just, you know, made their way over the Rockies and, you know, made their way into states with abundant arable land. Um, This strategy is severely limited. That said, Um, it only works where plants grow. So, you know, so for the states that have plants that grow, uh, they can absolutely do something that's better than turf grass or gravel. Excellent. And so, Kevin, now a question for you. So we know that Native Energy in October 2018 launched its renewable energy portfolio, which allows companies to both purchase the renewable energy credits they need and, of course, fund the construction of new community-scale renewable energy every year. The portfolio aims to build new projects and surpass 200,000 megawatt hours in renewable energy generation before 2025. Certainly a lofty goal. So the question is, do all of those projects in this portfolio include pollinator habitat? Yeah, so Native Energy's renewable energy portfolio emerged from uh, a collective view that was shared by by Native Energy and leading brands, certainly Cliff Bar uh, leading the charge along with with Lush and Lime as well. Um, and, and really with the, the view was we can do better. Uh, and initially the, the we can do better was focused on the renewable energy market and the desire to support new community scale renewables that that weren't moving ahead unless someone stepped in. And so, you know, that was kind of the, the starting point for it. Um, and then when we started engaging with, uh, with those brands and with the, the project developers, um, the, the concept of, of pollinator habitat really started to take root, uh, to use your pun over again, uh, <laughs> both internally at Native Energy and certainly, uh, you know, excited folks like Elisa at Cliff Bar to have, have that as a component of the program. Uh, and so, yes, all of the, the new uh, projects that are put into that portfolio uh, have or will have for future projects pollinator habitat uh, with them. And you mentioned Cliff Bar as one of the initial supporters. So, Elisa, maybe we turn to you here as we continue diving deep on how this all works. Can you give us an example? Like I know your bakery, I believe, in Twin Falls, Idaho, has one of these. Can you give us an example of a pollinator-friendly renewable energy site that Cliff Bar has supported? Yes. I just want to give a little historical context. We've been working with Native Energy since 2002, and we wanted to work with them as a partner because of their commitment to creating renewable energy solutions that create additional social benefits. So you hear community scale. That's really important to us, um, that we wanted to support projects like one that we were participating in through this portfolio that supports a 15-acre solar array in Forest City, Iowa. And when we learned about this, at the same time, we were working on building our own solar array at our bakery in Idaho. So we built a five-acre solar array out in the field along with additional solar panels over our parking lot. And I was on the team that worked on this this solar array. And when we came to the opportunity for the decision point, what, how are we going to treat the land that's under these solar panels? Yeah. That's what um, connected us both with um, Rob Davis at Fresh Energy and at the same time um, looking at our portfolio that, renew- of, um, that Native Energy was working on. So a lot of things came together at the same time. But our team at Cliff Bar at the bakery Uh, We got really excited when we saw there's a very important, different way to treat the land under 
this our solar panels. And we have a saying at Cliff Bar that we're a different kind of company. So we said a different kind of bakery needs a different kind of solar array. And this is where we went deeper on not only committing to um, finding the right seed mix and um, getting uh, flowering plants under the arrays, but also deciding that we need to educate the public. And so our solar array at Cliff Bar includes an educational trail that goes out from the bakery out mm. to the panels. And along the way, we have signage to help educate people. What is renewable energy? What is solar power? What are pollinators? Why are pollinators important to Cliff Bar? And this speaks to our larger effort to sort of build the movement around environmental solutions. And Elisa, I, I've got a quick question before we move on. Uh, so real quick, yeah. w- what what is your favorite Cliff Bar flavor, just so we're all on the same page? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Talk about picking among your children. <laughs> Holy cow. Exactly. Same same thing. I'll say I'll, apricot. Apricot. Oh, nice. Nice. Okay. okay well, well, thank you. Very important. I was just going <laughs> to – I was thinking the same thing. And I was just going to say that this whole idea of putting – pollinator habitat with renewable energy sites to me it's kind of like the icing on the cake or the icing on my cool mint chocolate cliff bar and <laughs> which I, is the best flavor yeah it's so good <laughs> uh, it's like eating a thin mint cookie so i that's why i asked the rob though like why would people not do this you know it just seems like an extra win and from what i understand it doesn't really cost extra money necessarily so uh, kudos to, for, to Cliff Bar for taking it on. And let's go back, though, to some basic questions about this stuff. So, Rob, you, you might be the one to answer this. How do you decide exactly what plants to put with your renewable energy site? Is it geographic dependent? Or maybe sometimes you're like, hey, we could do a variety of things, but let's try to attract this pollinator. Well, first off, I, I just absolutely love all the uh, conversation about which which food tastes best and which is our favorite. And, you know, so great of Elisa to, to highlight the apricot, um, you know, cliff bar, because you, d- you don't have cliff bars without pollinators. You know, every, sure. every apricot flower has to be visited four to eight times by uh, a bee or pollinator in order to produce one of those delicious fruits. But in terms of, yeah, what actually, you know, goes well under and around the site, that is one of the key questions that we're asking in partnership with the National New Renewable Energy Lab um, to, you know, to, to find out. So we have ongoing research. Now, the, the key answer, the short-term answer is um, we don't yet know what's best, but we absolutely know what's better than turf grass. So, mm. and, and, and th- those answers lie in the regional expertise of, uh, you know, of uh, farm bill biologists, of, of conservation professionals, of uh, experienced landscapers, basically folks that really have been working on conservation landscape for uh, for decades and decades. So they they know what's best and they know how to, you know, build and establish a, a meadow. Um, and then they have the, you know, the additional challenge of like, well, can you keep it growing below, you know, t- before below 30 inches or below 36 inches? Uh, because you never want the plants to grow up and, and shade the panels. Sure. And the beautiful thing is when you when you choose a, a, a specific high performance seed mixture, it can actually crowd out the, you know, the invasive and noxious weeds like, uh, like Canadian thistle that, you know, that might, you know, that might grow tall and shade the panels. So um, it's just that there's there hasn't been enough training between the civil engineers that are designing the, you know, the steel uh, and the and the silicon and the photovoltaics. You know, they just need more more cross training in the natural world and in in native plants and naturalized plants. Well, then, then maybe this episode is their first piece of homework for the, all those civil engineers. <laughs> but one more like, logistical question for you. So after, you know, it's, it sounds like you, you partner with the right on the ground maintenance crews that, that know the best practices to, to cultivate these habitats. But are they adopted pretty quickly by the pollinators? It, is it something that, you know, you see a pretty, pretty immediate uptake with? Or does it take them a while to recognize this habitat as one that they can you know, go through and pollinate it. You know, when you build it, they show up. Um, it's pretty remarkable. There's a, there's a great study um, from the United Kingdom um, highlighting the biodiversity benefits of solar parks. And so they actually measure the, you know, increase in diversity and increase in abundance 
uh, for a variety of different species. And um, so, you know, we can certainly uh, truck in or bring in a couple of honeybee hives because honeybees are the, the one animal uh, or one insect that, that does produce that honey in ways that we can, uh, you know, harvest it and celebrate, you know, conservation and, and, and landscapes that benefit pollinators. But if, if we don't, even if we don't bring in honeybees, um, you know, we, we, we have seen that the abundance of moths and butterflies and, and uh, hoverflies and, you know, all of the, the wildlife that's out there uh, responds really positively. So uh, if we build it, wildlife, uh, I guess Mother Nature takes care of the rest. It, it's the old field of dreams adage. If you build it, they will come. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, I, Jay, I think it's safe to say that you and I are pretty bought into this. We have drunk the Kool-Aid <sighs> on this idea of putting pollinator habitat with renewable energy sites. So how can we get policy to support more of these sort of sites? I know, Rob, we saw on your website a list of states that have these pollinator friendly scorecards can you tell us more about these and why it's so important that states adopt them how do they spur more of these sites to come into fruition the pollinator friendly solar scorecards are a policy tool that fresh energy and our allies that we mentioned before um, pioneered um, in partnership with the the state of minnesota uh, to basically constitute something that is a meaningful benefit to pollinators within the managed landscape of the solar farm. So these, these landscapes are not uh, a native restoration. They're not a prairie restoration. They're not creating, you know, a, a natural area. Um, they are a utility scale, you know, energy generation facility. That said, we know we can do better than turf grass. So, so the pollinator friendly solar scorecards are something that can go into the procurement. So you can say, hey, I want solar, uh, pollinator friendly solar. And please score the project on the pollinator friendly solar scorecard for X state. Um, or, um, you know, you can put it into county policies and say, hey, our county welcomes solar projects on the condition that, you know, they score X or, you know, X uh, number above. Um, or uh, there's a variety of other incentives and mechanisms. But certainly a procurement is one of the most powerful, as, as you can see with with Cliff Bar's outcome. They asked for pollinator friendly solar and that's what they got. I'd like to add that um, although this is a great solution where industrial scale, very large solar arrays are going in, it's it's really imperative that it does include a, a flowering landscape to support pollinators. But our particular interest in supporting community scale solar, as I mentioned in Forest City, that's, you know, 15 acres, we want to make sure that there's also the social benefit of um, having this benefit of leasing part of your farmland to smaller scale farmers. And that's why we love working with Native Energy, because we know that um, this is not taking up the entire farm. It's actually creating a benefit to the rest of the farm because there are pollinators there, an increased abundance of pollinators, which in turn, research is showing, increases yields. Even if it's not organic, we support organic farming, but if the adjacent farm is a pollinator-dependent crop like soybeans, research is showing that the yields of soybeans can increase even enough to offset the loss of land that was put into um, solar panels. And what we discovered along the way mm -hmm. was a job creation benefit because with Rob's help, we were able to connect with um, Bear Honey, a company that works with local beekeepers and had beehives uh, placed adjacent to this solar array. And then by the time we had our grand opening in uh, Twin Falls, we actually started through a a sister partner company, Cliff Family Winery, um, solar grown honey from those arrays and the bees that are, are feeding on the forage of the Forest City Solar Array. So we have this win, win, win for the environment and for actually lower cost on managing the landscape under the solar arrays. But we also are benefiting the farmer that's leasing the land in multiple ways and then this job creation impact of giving, um, creating that really what we're calling a solar grown honey supply chain mm. so that um, 
so that we actually can, we have, um, if you go to the website of the Cliff Family Winery, you'll see solar grown honey. And it comes from that forest city array. And when our solar, um, our vegetation is mature enough at Twin Falls, we'll be uh, producing honey from that. So I don't want to um, overlook the amazing opportunity that community scale solar brings to, to nature and people. No, I mean, Elisa, I'm glad you brought this up. And I guess I already said that Jay and I had drunk the Kool-Aid, but now we're really drinking it because you're just bringing up even more wins here. And I appreciate, Rob, you bringing up these scorecards and the fact that what they really do is create a numerical score such that you can put in your procurement guidelines, hey, it wherever you're buying X from, it's got to score this well on the scorecard. And that should hopefully drive people to invest in these sort of sites so that they score better on the scorecard and then they can sell their their products. I'll also want to pause and say there is a lawnmower next door to me, which is just happens in, in COVID recordings, but maybe we can just call that the buzzing of a honeybee that's kind of around my mic right now. <laughs> but uh, we do have- That's just reminding us all, that that's just there to remind us all as well of uh... The importance of electrification, right? <laughs> <laughs> I will say I've got one of those little push mowers that you just push and it just clips itself. And and I feel good every time I use that. But anyway, so mowers and, and, and bees aside, we do have a great diversity of, of perspectives here in this conversation. And so I want to keep that in mind as I bring us to a new topic here, which is the future of, of pollinators and renewable energy sites. So... The question that, that each of you can answer is, how can other companies and organizations best support more pollinator habitat with renewable energy projects? Do you guys have any policy recommendations for these companies and organizations, or even you know on the side, something that our listeners can do themselves? So I think Rob and Elisa have done a, a great job of kind of teeing up a lot of the points for how the future can look better. And certainly we're seeing, you know, although there is still a lot of, uh, of solar that could have pollinator habitat, we're seeing increased demand uh, and interest from you know, the private sector, the brands, the businesses that, uh, you know, as was mentioned before, are including you know, pollinator habitat or the scorecard in their RFPs and in their, in their search for renewables. So those are great signs and things for other brands to follow. But you know, there's other things, you know, just asking questions, putting these, these topics out there, engaging with the, with the projects and the project developers, bringing this to the forefront is, uh, you know, potentially not a very heavy lift. That's beautifully put, Kevin. And certainly for you know, for everyone that is uh, working at a food uh, company, it's working in a, a, a restaurant. Uh, the idea of using pollinator-friendly solar renewable energy credits has to be one of the most attractive things coming across your desk in, in the last 24 months. The idea of shifting over to 100% clean energy and uh, helping to save the bees at scale is incredibly exciting. And Elisa, anything that our listeners can do perhaps beyond supporting Cliff Bar via apricot or my personal favorite <laughs> crunchy peanut butter <laughs> Cliff Bars themselves. You know what? Actually, we have a saying about how to create change. Conversation creates change. And we need this adoption of standards to just be at all scales. And a lot of change takes place when someone just asks the question. This is a really important movement. But if we don't ask for this which will bring awareness, it's not gonna happen at scale. Our solar, the company that uh, was the developer for our solar array had never done this before. So people have to get out of their comfort zone a little bit and the companies that are paying them have to insist on this. I know that Rob, myself, Kevin, we're all available for any companies or community leaders that wanna talk about how they can do this. The pollinator crisis is as urgent as the climate crisis. We got to create solutions that solve both at the same time. Mm. Okay, well, Elisa, I'm glad that you emphasize the importance of conversations because it is a perfect segue into our final question. This is our traditional last question. So I want us to all imagine that we're at a party 
and maybe we're dancing drunkenly with the pollinators drunk on the nectar. Maybe we're just watching them do that. Uh, but we're at this party, and we want to engage the people we're at the party with about pollinators and perhaps this the specific approach of putting uh, pollinator-friendly plants with renewable energy sites. What is a party fact that we can say to our fellow partygoers to get them to say, whoa, and drop their drink about this topic? You know, I think something people can do is think very specifically about a species that we might all work together to take out of the endangered category. It's the Eastern monarch. The population has declined 99%. And it's hard to imagine a future without a monarch butterfly. And um, I think that solar plus habitat can be part of the solution to restore habitat and and help the monarch survive. I love that, Elisa, and you're absolutely right. Um, back in 2016, uh, President Obama's White House identified that to stabilize and renew the population of the Eastern Monarch, um, you know, across a variety of different landscapes, we would need to create an additional 6 million acres of conservation land. And particularly in this day and age, we need to bring solutions to scale that can do multiple things at once. We can't just fight climate change and, you know, transition off of coal and gas. Uh, we need to create habitat so that our kids have monarchs to show their kids to show their kids. So solar sites can absolutely provide a meaningful contribution toward that six million acre goal. All right. Well, thanks to you all for your important work on this multi-win approach to getting more pollinator habitat out there and more pollinators uh, thriving as a result. So keep up the good work. Thanks for educating our listeners on this. And we look forward to helping advance it even further. And I just really want to thank you all for making that subject of the birds and the bees so energizing. <laughs> oh, man. That's great. There's the closer we were looking for. <laughs> that is absolutely it. We do what we can. It's good practice for years down the line, AJ. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, you guys. All right. Well, thank you all Thanks so again. much. All right, Scott, as we wind down this episode, I have to ask you a, a quick question. What type of bee can't make up its mind? Oh, boy. I hope it's not our pirate-themed bee. What is it? <laughs> uh, maybe. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, boy. Bad joke to end the episode. Check. Did you come up with that, or did you look that up? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> no comment moving right along uh -huh. alright Jay let's thank some people for helping put this episode together first and foremost our lead researcher on this episode Adrian Breen my mom and thanks mom for joining the episode there to share your wisdom we'd also like to thank Shannon Parker for helping out with the research for this episode on top of Shannon always gotta thank Matt Ahrens for running the ship from a social media perspective and sharing across all of our platforms. Also like to thank Square Peg, Round Hole, and Potions for the music we use in this episode. And of course, listeners, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to our show, and specifically leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, where we see most of them like the one Scott's about to read. I'm about to read this one, Jay. I will say it's from May 11th, 2020, because we didn't get any new reviews so please uh, take the time to review it. It helps us get seen on iTunes. And because people don't seem to be writing them, you're likely to get a shout out on the show. So with that, I'm going to read one from Mads Holistic Health. All right. The title of the review is Love This Podcast. I just recently discovered this podcast a couple months ago and have been loving it ever since. I'm a huge sustainability nerd. And I love seeing others getting into the topic too. All their podcasts have been a great source for educating myself on what new sustainability initiatives are going on around the globe. Thank you guys for being so real and making learning an enjoyable experience with all the cheesy jokes. Matt's holistic health. Aw. Aw. <laughs> Just love that warm, fuzzy feeling. Or maybe, Scott, on this episode is a warm, buzzy feeling. Mm. And with that, Jay... I think that about does it. 
You all stay sustainable out there. I'm Scott Breen. And I'm Jay Siegel. We will see you next time. Thank you.